Okay, great. Um, welcome everybody um, to the first of a series of uh, dialogues around urban knowledge commons. Um, my name is Jessica Ilunga. I am a PhD student at Keio University. Um, today, I'm really happy to introduce the launch of this Urban Knowledge Commons, which is a series of dialogue conceived by Professor Amazon, Professor Dimmer, and Anastasia. Um, the, today's um, dialogue will be uh, mainly focusing on uh, the theme of um, applied urban studies research methodology. And today, we're really happy to have Professor Jordan San as our keynote um, speaker. Um, followed with him, we will also have a presentation by Alejandro, who is a PhD student from K University, and Anastasia herself um, from Tokyo Tech Institute. Um, so before I hand over to Professor Christian Dimmer to do the formal welcome and the overview of what the symposium is about, and also to formally introduce Professor Sand. Um, I would like to kind of speak about uh, how the setup is going to be, the symposium. Um, so it is an online Zoom meeting, which is going to be recorded. Um, so we are uh, encouraging everybody to uh, engage and have their uh, videos on if they are comfortable with having their videos on. Uh, so for those who are presenting, Professor Sand, Alejandro and Anastasia, if you are comfortable having your cameras on during your presentations as it will be recorded and published online, uh, you're more than welcome to have the video on or off. Um, the discussion part, which is coming after the presentations, will also be recorded. Um, we are encouraging everybody to have their videos on when they are speaking, um, but uh, if there are any changes in whether the recording of the discussion will be published or not, we will ask for everybody's consent uh, before that is published online. Um, so with that understanding, without further ado, I will now hand over to Professor Dimmer to uh, introduce the symposium. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Jessica, wonderful introduction. Welcome everybody. And um, yeah, my name is Christian Dimmer. I am um, teaching urban studies at Waseda University. And by trade, I'm an urban planner, urban designer. But yeah, so I would like to share a few slides um, before um, handing over to um, Folge for a few greeting words and then um, to our main act for today, namely uh, Professor John Sant with his um, lecture. Um, one second, let me just share my slides and hope that it that it works. Yeah, so um, who we are. Um, so we, we got together here on the initiative of uh, Anastasia. Um, we is um, Anastasia as, as uh, the kind of, of convener here of, of us. Um, she invited um, Professor Amazon Ojoge and me. Um, and we were talking about uh, creating a kind of recurring symposium in order to, to create a public space or a knowledge commons for um, urban researchers in Tokyo. And uh, Alejandro and um, Jessica were also um, very central in, in bringing this all together. Um, yeah, why this um, seminar here? Um, I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware of, of many different um, Tokyo publications. And with um, a few exceptions, um, we're always left with a sense that actually we, we haven't really gotten a good grasp yet of, of what Tokyo is. Obviously, this is a very big city. Obviously, cities are very dynamic. Um, they're constantly changing. They're very complex. So um, why this seminar then? The idea is to, to create a kind of emergent knowledge commons here for junior and um, senior researchers 
for resident and visiting researchers uh, in Tokyo. Resident means um, people who are based in Tokyo. You don't have to have an alien registration card or anything like that. So it's really just a kind of platform, a public space where we can come together and where we can exchange ideas. Uh, second, to develop a richer, more nuanced, uh, networked understanding and um, better descriptions of the dynamically emergent entity that is Tokyo. Um, a wink to um, Horges' wonderful book, um, The Emergent Tokyo, um, to discuss and test urban theories and research methods and their implications for better understanding Tokyo. And we're all working on, on different topics. We're all wrestling with a lot of theoretical material and a lot of methods. And this should be a place where we can talk about these things. Um, next, uh, to assemble lessons from Tokyo that can be applied to other cities uh, under certain qualifications, of course, um, to help making them more adaptable, resilient, exclusive, uh, inclusive, sorry, healthy and livable. Uh, lastly, most importantly, I think, um, from my experience as a PhD researcher, to break up the sense of isolation, to connect with other people and uh, to have fun together come on uh, let's let's make it useful let's let's make it fun let's make it pleasant um, what's the objective the objective could be to facilitate an ongoing urbanist conversation centering on tokyo um, to build some kind of inter-organizational transdisciplinary urbanism platform um, between different universities between different institutions to bring us out into a common space getting us out from behind those metal doors of our faculties and our institutions. Um, yeah, to build a space um, that can be open, friendly, where different people interested in urban Japan feel comfortable to share and discuss their idea. And lastly, and, and perhaps most importantly, to create deliverables as well. Um, to compile a book on innovative urban studies, research methods, on, on um, new ideas of thinking about Tokyo, and how they can contribute to a richer understanding of, of urban Japan and maybe cities elsewhere. Um, how will we proceed? Um, the idea that we discussed together so far was um, to have monthly meetings. Um, to create a, a, a knowledge commons where we can all contribute to its formation. Um, we're all on the same level here. We should all have the same um, weight. Um, in the end, the best argument, the best analysis um, should count. Um, so forget about, forget about our titles and, and credentials, but let's get together and, and have good debates here. Um, there will be a core group um, of, of people who have a bit more time, um, who are motivated, who are also committed um, to invest more effort than others. This is just um, as, as the way it is uh, usually. And perhaps we can work on an edited books, um, also maybe curating symposia or exhibitions. Um, so much about myself and about this forum. Um, I, I, we found it necessary to start um, with a bit of framework so that you understand what this whole thing is about. Um, fully recognizing, of course, um, that we have the, the, the rare chance to listen to somebody extremely knowledgeable about um, Tokyo, namely um, Jordan Sand. Um, I hope all of you have had a chance to, to read um, his, his work, it's very extensive, very rich um, from house and home and the concept of domesticity in, in, in modern Japan, uh, Tokyo vernacular, where he is more exploring um, the public realm. And his latest book um, was, or his most recent book that was not yet published um, was um, um, Teikoku Nihon no Seikatsu Kukan, so the, the living space um, in Imperial Japan. And um, I believe currently John is working on a big tome on um, the, um, the Grand Shrine of, of Ise. So, um, yeah, with this, I would like to hand over to uh, Jorge, who um, 
also wants um, to address you and um, then we will move um, and um, listen to Jordan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Um, well, and thank you, um, um, first of all, to uh, uh, Professor Jordan Sand to be for being with us and everyone who uh, is participating today. We wanted to keep it today kind of small scale and informal. Uh, so let's, uh, um, uh, as uh, Jessica mentioned before, um, we would like to at the end kind of make it uh, public the parts that we could say are more interesting and we will ask for everyone uh, for your permission. So in principle, let's uh, uh, make it uh, relaxed and, and an interesting, com interesting conversation. And uh, don't worry too much about the recording mark then on the top, the, the, this red dot that is a little bit intimidating because in any case, we, we can always delete the part that you are not so happy about, et cetera. So that shouldn't be a problem. So um, yeah, I think uh, Christian mentioned uh, all the important points. I think it's, it's uh, I think we kind of, we should recognize that um, in general in urban studies and architectural studies in general, I think there is a kind of lack of contextualizing uh, the knowledge that we get from Japan towards other countries and also the opposite, the, the immense knowledge that uh, we bring from our, each of us from our backgrounds and we can see like a, an immense diversity only from the names that we can see on the screen, like several cultures, several countries, uh, how to bring that diversity also to Japan, I think is a double task that we are in a particular, particular kind of um, relevant position to, to conduct that task. And I think there was no such a group until now, and we hope that we can uh, make it. I think in, in that sense, uh, in that sense uh, I think Jordan is doing a, a, a great, or has done a great job, and it's really an honor to, to welcome him uh, today. And uh, I would like just to, you know, uh, let him uh, start because I think uh, probably is what everyone is waiting for. So thank you, <laughs> Jordan. And, uh, and uh, please, uh, you can start with your presentation. Okay, just want to make sure everybody hears me okay. Yeah. Good. All right, because I've got the earphones. Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. And it's a delight to be here with you all. Nice to meet you. And I look forward to uh, our discussion. Uh, once again, a quick uh, congratulations and a plug again for uh, everybody who is involved in this wonderful project. I happen to have it by my side because it was in my knapsack. I was reading it again this morning in the uh, offices of the uh, Immigration Bureau. And uh, as a consequence, I am now uh, legitimately a resident again for another year. Um, in any case, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an important contribution. It's a beautiful book. So I just wanted to say shout out again on that uh, subject. Um, I have been allotted 25 minutes, and I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for the other uh, contributions and for discussion. So I'm going to set myself a little timer. I have not rehearsed or times to make sure that I get to the end, but my timer will tell me when I do. I have some slides, and I guess I'll just share screen if I could do that and start with my slides and run my timer. Okay, there's, is that there? Okay. Uh, so I've titled this Vernacular Landscapes and Forms of Commons, and I think uh, this book is uh, the reason I've been invited today and came out, came out in English several years ago. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, a Japanese edition was published just last year as well, so I'm um, uh, showing that off to you. Um, I want to introduce some of the arguments uh, in Tokyo Vernacular uh, today. And at the same time, um, seek to make a little more explicit uh, the politics in the separate chapters of this book and the politics in how we talk about commons. Uh, and I'm going to do that by more by posing questions than by giving you answers. So uh, more explicitly than uh, most of what appears in this book, uh, today's talk will be about uh, thinking about commons and thinking about um, how we talk about it. I think that we share that uh, this is a, a, an appealing and attractive um, idea. 
when we talk about cities. Um, and I was thinking this morning as I uh, reread Emergent Tokyo that it's got an attractiveness that's rather similar to the concept of an emergent urbanism because it's in between. It's in between public and private, much as the emergent, uh, as uh, described by the KO team, is in between the top-down state-imposed plan and unregulated bottom-up commercial um, development. No, here we go, advance this way. Excuse me. So let me first, though, say a word of clarification about the public and the commons. And uh, this and maybe a number of other things I say will seem self-evident to many of you. But as Jorge pointed out a minute ago, we all come from different backgrounds. And sometimes things that seem clear to us uh, actually deserve uh, a little attention uh, to clarify together. And I say this because um, Tokyo Vernacular actually appeared in Chinese before it did in Japanese, and I had the pleasure of talking about it at a couple of universities in China. And in that translation process and in presenting the book, um, I discovered that the public versus the commons was conceptually quite difficult to articulate in China. Of course, they have the words, but they didn't, they didn't register for people the same way. And I came to feel that that had to do with being in a society where the state was conceived, at least ideology taught, that the state is coeval with the people, which means that there isn't that in between that is conventionally called civil society and sociology. Now, that isn't to say there isn't a civil society in China. It is to say the conceptual categories were not sort of there immediately to hand. So to be explicit, when we talk about space, when we talk about land, uh, public is held by the state for the benefit of the citizens, or so one hopes, but it's held by the state. And th the whole idea of commons starts with the fact that uh, there's no one party holding it. Uh, and beyond that, the implication that some kind of mutual agreement sustains it. There are many forms of commons, uh, and some of the interesting ones for historians like myself uh, have very long traditions uh, and include uh, uses of um, non-urban land, like what's called panage or forest land that's made available for all to uh, graze their animals or to collect firewood or what have you. Uh, another tra traditional uh, sort of commons, of course, is the sea. Uh, and uh, it continues to be a a space contested, but nevertheless a space uh, in which uh, questions of common use are, are being worked out now today under international law. Uh, but here, uh, just to, to, to impress upon you that this is an urban space, uh, that in the case of Edo Tokyo, uh, we had a much enjoyed um, maritime commons very near to hand, not long ago, because uh, the bay was shallow uh, really kind of mud flats, a good kilometer out from uh, as far as, you know, from, from what is today the shoreline. Um, and so lots of people went out to um, dig for shellfish. But uh, talking about nature as commons in this uh, fashion uh, leads naturally into conversations about sustainable use and about problems of unsustainability. Uh, and most famously in the field of ecology, this phrase uh, devised by Garrett Hardin, uh, the tragedy of the commons um, emerges. And I expect this is a term that you have encountered and uh, thought about. And I just grabbed from the commons of the internet a couple of cartoon representations of forms this can take one in the case uh, on the left of a depleted aquifer uh, because somebody believes uh, this is inexhaustible, nobody's going to stop me anyway, and they take as much as they want until there isn't enough anymore. Um, the top right and urban version um, in which the, the commons is uh, public roadways and uh, everybody thinks somebody else should have left their car at home. 
Um, I bring this up now uh, um, because it's always going to be present when we talk about commons, and it's present when we talk about urban commons too. Uh, now, some of you may know that uh, Garrett Hardin has been uh, re-examined, uh, found to have been a white supremacist, among other things, uh, and we have many, many uh, excellent counter examples of uh, uh, um, well-managed commons shared by mutual consent. Uh, and so his rather sort of absolutist uh, or, or, or um, um, laissez-faire um, absolutist um, uh, interpretation of the way a commons will inevitably de be uh, uh, depleted and destroyed uh, is uh, certainly open for question, but the, uh, the the issue of how to balance um, self-interest and uh, mutual management of a resource uh, doesn't go away. And it appears in the urban context as well. And I think, for example, the picture I have at the bottom of uh, uh, a um, informal settlement in a waterway in, in Manila, and, and as you know, Manila is a city with a lot of informal settlements. And um, one wants to be, as, as a, a progressive urbanist, one wants to be on the side of uh, the weak and the discriminated against and find a way. In fact, I think we have many things we can learn from informal settlers. At the same time, uh, there is a natural resource and uh, informal settlers are part of uh, the problem, in effect, uh, in this instance, with uh, that common resource, namely the waterways of Manila. So I just bring it up to, to uh, uh, flag the unavoidable uh, political complexity of talking about commons. Uh, just briefly, uh, parks begin. Uh, parks are, of course, a public resource uh, provided by municipalities and states. Parks begin as commons in much of the world. And uh, the first public park in the United States is an instance, and that's Boston Common. And it begins with uh, a resource, grass for cows, uh, and um, comes under municipal management later on. Uh, and it, as it does so, of course, it also transforms into a uh, site of bourgeois leisure. And potentially, as you see here with this parade of soldiers over to the left, a site of um, state pageantry as well. Tokyo has a rich history of uh, um, urban commons as well. And I expect if you're familiar with the work of uh, Idenobu Jinnai and others, uh, this is uh, not new to you to see that the riverbanks uh, near Ryogoku Bridge, for example, were a great uh, gathering place and something of, of a festival uh, uh, atmosphere uh, in the uh, Edo period. Um, but note that uh, all of the buildings here are temporary structures because this place was not granted to the public for their leisure. It was built, at, it was opened as a uh, fire break and then illegally occupied by these temporary structures. Uh, of course, when we think of uh, uh, plazas as common spaces, pleasant leisure areas in cities. We tend to think first of the great piazzas uh, of uh, cities in Italy. Um, and as we look at this, we should at the same time remember that uh, this place was not designed for people to listen to a little bit of light music and enjoy a glass of wine. It happens to work very well for that purpose. Um, but there's a history of usages and, limit and limitations upon usage of state claims and popular claims to the space in any uh, um, urban common area. So to talk of uh, big public spaces, commons, is to talk uh, not only of spontaneity, but of questions of rights and of the freedom of citizens. Uh, and that is what citizens of a country or a municipality are entitled to and what a public plaza should guarantee them. At the same time, uh, it should be, uh, it is inevitably a talk of actual uses. What do people want uh, or need to do in this place? What kind of activity in this space, what is the space good for? What sort of activities? These latter are, are, are design questions, but as I think you can see, they 
bleed into uh, social and political issues. And so I now move into uh, examples from Tokyo. Uh, here are two massive public uh, gatherings, one in front of the Diet Building in 1960 and the other in the Shinjuku West Exit Plaza in 1969. So let me take you to Shinjuku West Exit Plaza. Uh, this is a, a quite famous story, and it's one I tell in the first chapter of uh, Tokyo Vernacular. Uh, but uh, in short, uh, here was a place called Plaza Hiroba, uh, built as an extension to the uh, station, uh, one that many of you, I expect, know, in 1967. And in the summer of 1969, uh, at the height of protests against the Vietnam War, it was claimed as a kind of new urban commons for collective action led by a group of people uh, who called themselves the folk guerrillas. They sang anti-war songs, people gathered around, uh, people uh, debated, people sold pamphlets of their poetry, and uh, people sang and protested and uh, went home. Once a week, it became that kind of a gathering place. And it uh, swept out into the uh, roadway. This was part of the newly designed plaza, of course, but uh, not intended to be given over entirely to pedestrians, as you see it here in this dramatic photograph. And you can see the mixture of uh, organized protesters and people just sort of milling and hanging out uh, that characterized this space in the summer of 1969. Well, famously, uh, this reached a crescendo uh, in confrontation between radical students and the police, after which uh, all in one night, the police changed all of the signage in the Shinjuku West Exit Plaza area. Uh, the name uh, became Concourse instead of Plaza, and a lot of police uh, were on site to make sure that nobody loitered, let alone seen or demonstrating. A famous story from 1969, and for many, I think a kind of a, a, a founding story of, uh, or an ending story, if you like, of a, of a decline of the possibilities of public space in Japan. Uh, a footnote we should uh, uh, observe that once again, the West Exit is called a, a plaza. Uh, presumably, the perceived threat or the threat that the police perceived in 1969 uh, abated sufficiently. They decided uh, it was safe once again to imagine it as a plaza. But I should note that even the participants in 1969 recognized as an urban space, this place was very far from ideal for those sort of uh, um, gathering and socializing and political debate and so forth that people had invested uh, in the, the notion of a, a common a plaza for the people. It's really a commuter space. Uh, it happened to serve their purposes for a time in 1969. Um, one can schematize this story, in a sense, by thinking of the public and the private and the common as they evolved in the context of uh, post-war urban politics in Japan. If you go back to Ampo 1960, and that's what you see bottom left here, there was this very powerful conception among demonstrators at that time that the public was what had uh, been given to the democratic, that is the sp spaces of, of the public had been given to the democratic nation to shape their politics. And so as private citizens, they went to the streets around the diet, which was uh, in a sense, a, a state conferred space for their uh, enaction of democracy um, to uh, realize a better democracy. This was the image, I think, of public and private in uh, the democratic movement of 1960. The Shinjuku uh, spontaneous demonstrators and sing-along uh, leaders in 1969 were trying to open up something in between. Nobody had said, this is the space of national politics. And nobody had said, you can be here, actually. They just said, this is called a plaza. And it's really for commuters, but people, people could repurpose it until they were stopped by the police. And so what they were doing was creating that in-between kind of space in the Shinjuku West exit, which was a commons for a time. And of course, then the police shutting it down closes off 
uh, all of the sort of political possibilities and the actual uh, uh, sort of uh, physical activities of that space for a time uh, and compels people to view the commons as they could find it or to search for the commons as they could find it within the private realm. And so the argument of uh, Tokyo vernacular is really to pursue the way people went looking for commons uh, beyond that moment when the public uh, aspect of it, excuse me, had been uh, um, closed to them. And uh, they go looking for it, or so I argue, in various forms of usable past. And here's where the uh, idea of the vernacular comes in, because the usable past for imagining the commons was not great monumental buildings. It was vernacular spaces. And I'm not going to walk through the, uh, all of the subsequent chapters and just instead highlight one of them. Uh, um, but uh, subsequently, people go towards different sorts of uh, spaces that seem to hold that potential for uh, imagining a new commons using the material existing in the city's past. And uh, those three spaces I explore, the space of the neighborhood and the street and the museum. Let me take you briefly to the issue of neighborhood. And here's where I'd like to uh, ask questions again and be more explicit about the politics of this. When we talk about neighborhood community, which I call here a limited commons. The talk leads to tradition, identity, communality, what ensures mutual trust between people, uh, what conditions do people, what are the conditions under which people will care for each other? And those are all good values to pursue. Um, there are design questions connected to this as well, of course, connected to preservation, uh, uh, connected to spatial scale. I think you recognize all of this. But there are also questions of a difficult political nature. Whose community? Uh, what kind of hierarchies uh, sustain that community, like gender hierarchies often? Uh, who is excluded? And what about people who don't want to participate? And then conversely, what to do when one person's community becomes another person's tourist destination? And I think all of these are social political questions that open up into urban design questions as well. Um, the chapter I discussed neighborhood community in focuses particularly on the magazine and the activities of uh, the so-called Yanesen neighborhood. And I'll just sort of uh, ripple through a couple of images here. Uh, Yanesen has become known since the magazine uh, uh, and the movement was founded in the 1880s, become known much more widely as a neighborhood of alleyways. And I think uh, the attraction of these spaces is uh, um, very understandable and very widespread and one that um, I share. But is the answer, we preserve these alleyways? And of course, this is where the politics of community and the politics of historic preservation come into play. To take an extreme example, the town of Tsumago, uh, very, very different context, of course, but uh, um, the first place to be given a national street escape preservation district uh, designation, 1975, uh, became a place just totally un overrun with tourists and normal life really doesn't exist there anymore. Um, at the first stage, as the magazine made the neighborhood known, uh, uh, Yanesen too uh, experienced a lot of media attention, but it's only much more recently. And I, I think that kind of fed back into the local movement, but initially that could be a positive thing. It's only much more recently that media are really transforming the place. Um, the second, this is going to be the last example I give, um, it is an interesting one. Jorge and I, I started a conversation about this, and I look forward to talking some more about it. Um, and that is the, the uh, a phenomenon of uh, various forms of movement of urban exploration and appropriation from street space. And the example that I focus on in the book is uh, the Street Observation Studies Society. 
uh, the Lojo Kansatsu Gakkai. And their commons is one that's unclaimed, awaiting uh, the explorer. And of course, there's a there's a, a parodic element to this because you know, in what sense is a city like Tokyo uh, unexplored or unclaimed? Uh, uh, it's uh, you know a city of uh, uh, of millions, and it's a city that's uh, well policed. Um, but of course, the city under uh, consumer capitalism is always sort of challenging us to find the place outside, to find what hasn't been totally uh, um, commodified or totally uh, managed bureaucratically. And that's what this was uh, all about. Uh, I'll just uh, put in a plug for this book. Um, this is the Ur text of street observation studies uh, published, I think first 1981 or so called Hyper Art Thomason. And if you don't own it, go get it. It's just a, it, it's a really, it's a cult book and it's a really precious book. The uh, English translation uh, is presently out of print, but it's supposed to be uh, back in print in a couple of months. Uh, I want to press it upon you. Um, I wrote an afterward, so I admit this is an advertisement. Um, but here too, it, the, you know, this is about uh, appropriation. It's about artistic sensibility and its possibilities in uh, the contemporary city. Um, and, you know, it's about kind of reading against the grain, but here too, there are questions. Um, Maybe I'll just start with one. Is this more than a new form of consumerist fantasy? Let me now take you into what these people did because it's a, if you haven't encountered it, it's a, a, a quixotic but very charming project. Um, so it starts with artist Akasegawa Genpei's uh, um, um, definition of what he called hyper art Thomasons, uh, which are, um, useless protuberances on the city beautifully preserved. And the first example was the so-called pure staircase of Yotsuya. You see, it goes up, there's a landing, no entrance, and it goes down again. And somebody has gone to the trouble to replace one of the slats on this wooden railing. These he called hyper art Thomasons. Thomason was the name of a baseball player who performed badly. Um, the other thing you can see from Akasegawa's book is that this is also a project about acts of claiming things in public space, however trivial, appropriation. And then it also becomes about anonymous other people claiming public space in interesting and quixotic ways. Okay. The last uh, section of the book is about museums. I will leave that aside and close with my final slide, uh, just to come back to the issue of the politics of the way we talk about commons. And so I've given you three examples here. Uh, the imagining of a commons in a actually rather workaday com commuter space in 1969 in Shinjuku. The imagining of commons or the, the, the reclaiming of the value of commons as we see it in intimate neighborhoods and their traditions in Tokyo. And then uh, the imagining of a commons in the streets of the city, wherever it appears there are opportunities for appropriation. And there's my alarm. And I just like to throw out there, I'm afraid these labels may feel a little bit like, you know, read your personality from your zodiac sign or from your blood type, but it is useful to use the big political concept terms just to as place markers. And so I will note for you that the, the politics implied in the first instance are anarchist or revolutionary socialist politics. The politics implied in the second are communitarian socialist politics. And the politics implied in the third are anarchist bleeding into the libertarian end of the spectrum. Um, and you can pick and choose, uh, and you can recognize the sort of intersections of all of them in particular spaces you're interested in or designing. Um, but I think it's useful to 
bring the politics up to the surface and say, well, what are we doing politically or what are we valuing politically? That's my last slide. So mm -hmm. I'll just unshare. Thanks. Wonderful, um, very insightful lecture, Jordan. Wonderful, very nice. Um, yeah, true to the idea of, of the comments, we had some kind of preconceived um, program and um, we will change this on the fly. Um, I think it would be very odd just to continue and, and ignore what we have seen and, and all those nice um, provocative questions and, and thoughts. So um, let's open up the floor here um, uh, for now. And if you have questions here from, from those of you who are not familiar with the work of Jordan, um, who haven't really thought about public, private, and the comments, um, if you would like to comment or if you have a factual question or so, please um, don't hold back. Um, in the meantime, while um, they are thinking about their questions, um, um, I would like to add, um, David Harvey has a very interesting, or a very useful definition of, of comments. Harvey, um, also um, people like uh, the Angelis, um, they're working with this idea that a comments is this kind of element that consists of three different factors that are interlinked. Um, you have a community, who feels responsible for a common resource or so community, common resource, and then they engage in commoning activity. So a community, a commons, a common resource, and the common the, perf the activity of performing incessantly the commons. And I think this is a very important and very useful uh, kind of conceptualization because it helps to understand this kind of dynamism as well. Um, it also helps to understand that it, that it needs a certain degree of exclusion as well in order to create a sense of responsibility. But at the same time, the idea of the common is to be open for everyone and uh, malleable and formable for everyone at the same time. So there are a lot of different ideas built into it. And I, I've just finished teaching a 15 unit course on, on the commons and I still only feel that I'm scratching on the surface. So I'm very curious to hear more. And um, if anybody has questions, please don't hold back. Well, yeah. I, maybe I can start, sorry, so as a kind of warming up, but I think what um, Jordan mentioned today, I think it was um, very, very important also, and it connects with the uh, also issue of methods uh, or how we research the city. Because um, Jordan, if correct me if I'm wrong, you are framing each kind of attitude, even methods, how we study neighborhoods or what we look at as researchers uh, within a certain political framework. So um, then, I mean, we can we can agree or not if that is the correct framework. I mean, everyone. I mean, there there might be different opinions, but it, I think um, we kind of as as uh, uh, international researchers that come to Japan, we tend to forget the background story, the the the, the history that shaped those approaches, and we just arrive and we say, okay, these uh, street observation studies are great, and we imitate them because they look like fun and so on, but we don't understand that there is a political project behind. Uh, I think it's very important that you mentioned that. My question would be, uh, this is a huge question. What would, you, what would you think it's a relevant, politically relevant project from now on? Because I think the, 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 the period of maybe um, anarchist, anarchist uh, libertarian, uh, libertarian approach, I think there are, there is, certain limits to it. Um, maybe liber libertarian approaches sometimes uh, connect with neoliberal approaches too, I, I, I would say. Less as fair kind of approaches to the city. Uh, that's my opinion. So what do you think it would be the next uh, politically relevant approach uh, for us to explore? Huge question. Sorry, yeah, it, it is. No, thanks for that, though, and and thank you to Christian for getting things started as well. Um, I, I'm afraid my response is going to be 
a kind of a, a, a word cloud. <laughs> that is to say, I, I think what I'd like to do uh, with what I gave you today is let everybody take what they can that's useful from it. That is that it should speak to activism as well as to research potentially. It, could, it should speak to what you might, some of you may do as designers as well as what some of you may do uh, as uh, researchers on the present and past uh, condition of the existing city. Um, I am a historian and this, as I mentioned in the introduction or the preface to this book, this book, it didn't actually start out as a history book, but I took so long on it that it kind of became a history book. So it's a, it's a history from 1969 forward. Um, but uh, it, I, I'd like to think that indeed it, uh, it's a it's a collection of uh, stories, problems posed that are about urban method, both uh, in terms of potential design issues as well as in research issues. So I hope it does that. And I wanted today to make, make a little more explicit than the book does in its rather long winded way, make a little more explicit that indeed each one of them implies a political project. How much they would say this was our political project. I would say it was pretty explicit in 1969, but I think there are many community activists who never really quite figure out what politics it is they're espousing, and even more sort of urban flaneur types <laughs> who would bridle at being called libertarian, but the implications of whose work might be considered to be part of such a political project. So, uh, you know, uh, but I think that's even a little bit too pat. And that's why, you know, you can go back to say we're talking about the research value of the kind of exploratory mode that is, you know, in the uh, street observation studies. I mean, that's the kind of most par parodic form, but it actually has a rich tradition in this country. The previous, uh, the case of modernology, I think remains a fascinating uh, um, method. So so let's say you, you're attracted to that and you're thinking about yourself as an urban explorer and what the implications of the method are. I like the idea of going back to Harvey's factors that uh, Christian just alluded to, because Harvey is starting with the assumption that commons is, is a positive value. So let's make sure that when we do it, like the street observationists or like the uh, uh, student movements in the in 69, when, it, when we do commons, we're sort of checking in to make sure it's realizing in whatever form, realizing those values. And I think that that's actually possible. You can say, well, I'm going to take the exploratory approach, but the ends of sort of establishing a malleable urban community or helping make it possible, the ends of sharing resources and the ends of how we share, how we common them are going to be built into my project. I think that's possible in each of these instances, it, but it means kind of, starting with some political self-awareness and thinking through how you can realize those um, uh, um, positive values. I'll go, I mean, I just used the word malleable that Christian raised. I think that as, as you say, that there are no grand projects that um, we can look at without suspicion today, but that doesn't mean we can't think up um, malleable interventions that might serve a kind of a kind of uh, um, common good or a public we don't even know yet in the years to come. Can I uh, enter into the discussion from this one? Hello, thank you for the presentation. And it was very educational for me. Um, and I would like to ask, um, in order for architects in our case or our urbanists to be able to intervene in a way to be able to bring forth um, big projects that are not so suspicious. I, I, I'm starting to imagine that there is something in the role of the architect as it is shaped in our society uh, contemporarily that 
um, has within it certain limitations that uh, do not allow us to even intervene into the planning and into the intentions. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Thank you. Um, I think that would be a shame if as an architect, that's what you thought, <laughs> um, which is to say, I, I mean, I think that the rest of society awaits your creative interventions. Uh, I just, when I said there are no big projects, I meant the kind of, you know, I, uh, that the the master narrative of modernity is uh, no longer serves us. It's a rather old thing to say, but that um, that uh, uh, um, you you have to intervene creatively if that's if that's your metier, if what you do is build, um, and that I mean precisely. I think that sort of that that kind of middle level intervention that that that. Uh, um, recognizes existing fabric, but, you know, tries to uh, imagine a, a new and better city remains uh, uh, you know, more crucial than ever. I think that's precisely what I read the uh, Emergent Tokyo project to be about too. Um, maybe so I could, yeah. oh, okay, sorry, yeah. go ahead. So, so you would think that um, the way that uh, our economies, our, the economy has changed to a more neoliberal um market um and the fact that the programs and the cost effectiveness of projects um are putting real pressures to design studios i guess does not affect the way that architecture is produced nowadays i i would think that there is a big professional disintermediation going on like uh, for example this is not on a personal level i do yeah. think that we have agency and that we as uh, scientists of space uh we have a lot to say on diagnosing and um, finding solutions and imagining these projects, but somehow mm -hmm. our hands are getting more and more tight due to the structural um, operation of our economies and our societies. Hmm. Hmm. You reach beyond my expertise. Um, I'm concerned to hear you say that. Uh, I have a feeling people have been saying it since the 60s. Uh, maybe they have more and more reason to do so. Um, but if that's true, maybe you can learn from how earlier generations handled the malaise that they felt about that. I mean, I I, I think of you know, Isozaki Arata recognized in you know, the mid 1970s. He said, you know, the generation before us were builders for the state. They were guaranteed. I mean, that is the certain, you know, elites, todai, architects, whatever. But what he meant was that they could imagine themselves as builders for the state. And even the metabolism movement still depended on the idea that they would create these megastructures and everything would hang off of their master plan, you know. Um, um, and, and that's being given the lie because, you know, uh, commercial capitalism now rules the city. So he was saying that in the early 70s. Um, and he had a career anyway, some of it's kitsch, <laughs> but some of it's very, very uh, uh, exciting work as well. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I would like to add here one more thing that um, perhaps it's uh, helpful to think about uh, the commons serving different kind of functions. I think one is, is a normative one, um, is this kind of perpetual claim, this perpetual um, call of action um, to uh, to open up the city to make it a common to preserve it as a common because it has been built by many many generations of people with their bodies with their taxes with um, with their political actions and so forth and we're just capitalizing on it um, now as as current as the current um, generation and the second one is and i think this is um, also quite interesting um, it serves as an analytical device to understand how the world is without making such a statement for example we can we see comments everywhere um, and they vary in the degree of their openness they vary in the degree of of their intentionality a business Im improvement district is often described by many commons researchers as a commons like in madono um, the, the area management organization um, but you could also um, yeah or the community garden on the other side um, the project that is feeding homeless people and people bring their own resources and they cook food and they go out and bring it 
um, both can be seen analytically as, as a commons, but they're very different. And I think having this kind of understanding helps us to look very carefully um, what are the commoning processes, how much ownership and agency do the participants actually really have, uh, how democratic, how flat is, is, is the decision making, who is able to take part and not. And then you realize that actually what is being sold to us as a commons sometimes is not that, that intensive of a commons at all and comes very close to, to state directed interventions. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just that as a qualification for my side. I, I want to just pick up the very beginning of what you were saying. I mean, all of this is important, but just to pick up one one, one uh, thread here, um, that uh, if we think of it as a the commons is a sort of a shared responsibility. Um, uh, you know, I, I am still a bit of a preservationist, I admit, and uh, this book kind of deconstructs that, but uh, I, I think that where it remains in that sense, a historical preservationist book is that I think we're heirs, those of us who occupy and work in and build in the city today are heirs to something that was created by many, many, many people before us. And that interests me a lot. You know, we want to maintain something that was bequeathed to us. Uh, how literally you want to take that with regard to particular spaces and particular buildings, but then, but then the sort of that's where the so-called rubber hits the ground. That's where you actually have to make these contested decisions. But the idea that we're heirs is kind of humbling. It means that something that was sustainable has been passed to us to continue sustaining, and I think that's valuable. Uh, um, so I'll just comment in that vein. Um, anybody else questions or comments? Anything is allowed. Let's make use of the opportunity. Now you have Jordan here. Um, next month you will just have to do with us guys. So uh, <laughs> oh, is that now, right? I've, I've, now it matters. I've, I've been sent packing. Have I? <laughs> no, no, anyway, I, I would like to, yeah, I'd like to hear from everybody. And if I can drop in another time, I will. Very good. No, um, this is not to send you packing. Um, you're welcome. Everyone is. Um, the more the merrier, actually. But it's also the more people actually have a voice and, and dare to ask, um, the better as well. I, I know um, when I was a PhD student, it was horrible. Um, I found you